Thank you very much. If I could get the clicker, um, and if I could get my slides, uh, be wonderful. Um, so, thank you. The, uh, the history, the origin of astrobiology is closely connected with the history of planetary exploration uh, in the 1960s when we were first sending spacecraft to other planets, uh, it was recognized there was the need to protect life, both protect Earth life and potentially uh, extraterrestrial life from each other, uh, and uh, the need to uh, consider how we would uh, possibly find life elsewhere. So that, that was really the origin, and it's expanded as a field to the point where um, we are not just exploring space, although that's, that's still a big part of it with spacecraft and telescopes and space telescopes, but we also do a lot of research on Earth field work on, uh, to study life in extreme environments and planetary analog environments, as well as laboratory work um, considering the origin and evolution of life and, and computer modeling. Uh, all this gives us, um, uh, I think, an interesting perspective. Uh, we, we, uh, astrobiology is very much a field of deep space and deep time, and I think tracing life's history and nature through this lens uh, can provide uh, some interesting perspective on uh, our current global changes and, and challenges. Uh, there are, um, one of our very powerful tools is comparative planetology. Now that we've uh, been able to study many of the planets of our solar system, at least up close, we look at the similarities and differences, and, and, and we learn a lot. One thing you quickly learn, as, as you can see in this image, that there, there's a certain uh, similarity of form and, and, and structure and, and, and function that nature chooses in different environments using the, the materials at hand. So you, in these river deltas on three different planets, you can see the obvious commonality, and yet when you look at the differences, it, it tells us stories about the different histories of these planets. So on the left, uh, this delta on Venus was clearly not caused, carved by water. It's way too hot there. This was carved by flowing volcanic um, lava. And over on the lower right, this delta on Mars was uh, left by an ancient river flowing into an ancient lake, which has not flowed in billions of years, as you can tell by the uh, erosional patterns and the superimposed impact craters. And in the center on Earth, we see a delta that is obviously on a planet with an active hydrological cycle and the pervasive influence of life. Now, comparative planetology has also taught us a lot about a lot of atmospheric and other processes that uh, have really helped us to understand some of the environmental, environmental challenges we face on Earth today. My um, actual scientific published research uh, is uh, very involved in climate modeling, but most of my climate modeling is on other planets. Yet, of course, we use the techniques and models from, from uh, from, from Earth science, and we modify them in different ways, and sometimes in doing that, we learn things that we didn't know about our terrestrial models and, there have been, been, and, and about the Earth itself, and there have been several important insights in, in learning about uh, global warming and learning, uh, actually, the, uh, the uh, problem with the ozone layer that was discovered um, largely because, uh, at first, because scientists were studying what chlorine, how chlorine and oxygen inter interacted in the upper atmosphere of Venus, and that helped us understand what was happening to ozone on Earth under the influence of chlorine. The theory of nuclear winter was devised by scientists who had been studying dust storms on Mars and likewise acid rain. Many of our, uh, there are many insights uh, we've gained into uh, um, some of our environmental challenges from studying other planets. And then, of course, we've surrounded Earth by, uh, with Earth observation satellites, and it's almost as if our planet has sprung this new organ of self-observation just in time when we are also modifying the planet in a way that we really need to understand. Um, so, uh, you know, Earth observations uh, born of space technology are obviously crucial in our uh, coming to understand and then hopefully dealing with uh, some of the challenges we've been talking about. I'm not going to talk at length about that because I know the next talk by uh, Professor uh, Maria Zuber will talk m in more detail about uh, space technology and sustainability. Uh, I am instead 
going to talk a little bit about the perspective we gain on life and on uh, maybe even on um, techno technological civilization from looking at other planets. The comparison um, between li lifeless and living worlds has led to some really important insights. And uh, you've all heard of the Gaia hypothesis. What you may not know is that when Jim Lovelock conceived of the Gaia hypothesis, he was working for NASA on the question of how do you search for life on Mars. And this led Lovelock to realize that a planet with a global biosphere like Earth will always have a drastically altered atmosphere, which can be a clue, that the thermodynamic um, disequilibrium can be a clue to the presence of life on the planet. And then he teamed up with Lynn Margulis, who's really one of the founding mothers of astrobiology at NASA, to come up with uh, the uh, Gaia hypothesis and this very famous uh, early paper, Atmospheric Homeostasis by and for the Biosphere, the Gaia hypothesis. And Gaia, you know, a as controversial as it's been, it's also been very influential and profound and led to a lot of what is today considered Earth system science, where we realize we cannot separate the biotic influences in the Earth system from um, the other Earth systems. Um, and we know now, um, partly uh, I think due to the insights from this kind of comparative planetology and, and astrobiological inquiry, that life is very much a planetary scale process with a cosmological lifespan and that we in our biosphere are deeply entwined with other planetary systems. Now, this perspective on life as a whole planet phenomena is uh, very much central to the way we think about biosignatures or finding the evidence of life on other planets, especially when it comes to exoplanets. And again, we're gonna hear more about exoplanets later this morning, so I won't dwell on this, but uh, when you look over on the uh, right side of this slide, you see um, the um, inferred spectra of three different inhabited planets. And all three are Earth at different phases, the modern Earth, the Proterozoic, and the Archean. And we can actually model their spectra, and that helps us when we are looking with JWST, as was mentioned, the James Webb Space Telescope, and especially as we design our next space telescope, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which we're specifically designing to look for the spectra of inhabited worlds. And the reason why these spectra are different from Earth and these different epochs has to do with the influence of life and, uh, you know, the more modern oxygenation of the atmosphere, and uh, we believe there was a much more methane-rich atmosphere when the Earth was young before the oxygen uh, rose. And, and uh, over on the left there, I won't go through all this, but there's a complex series of um, feedbacks and interactions between different Earth systems and the biosphere that have led to the modern um, state of the Earth and that, in fact, we can trace over time on uh, past states of the Earth. Now, when we think about the current transition that Earth is going through, um, when I think about this as an astrobiologist, I can't help but think of it as this sort of sequence of long transitions and wonder, you know, if from that, through that lens, what is the nature of this transition? And in thinking that way, although there's a lot of talk about when the Anthropocene began, as we've heard, to, uh, well, this week, and I think those, that, uh, those discussions have been very important and fruitful, I'm also really fascinated with the other, the other end <laughs> of the chronological spectrum. Uh, when, when will the Anthropocene end, or will it end? I mean, we, we're at this time where now we're geological, biological, and human history have become uh, uh, entwined. Have they become irreversibly entwined? Uh, is this, are we actually looking at a long-term planetary transition? And this relates in an interesting way to another aspect of my field, which is the search for techno-signatures. If you do the math of SETI, and some of you have seen the Drake equation, and I won't go into it now, but the main point I want to derive from it here is that we've learned uh, from fairly simple math that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and civilization is very much connected with the question of longevity of civilizations. Basically, if there are very long-lived civilizations we should be able to find some. If they're always short-lived, meaning, you know, a thousand years or, or less, I'm talking technological civilizations that leave a technological mark on the planet in the way we are now. If they're always short-lived, then we won't be able to detect them. So the question of, of SETI 
um, the fundamental question is very much connected, I think, to some of the fundamental questions that we're asking about ourselves now. Namely, is it possible for a global technical civilization to form a long-term stable relationship with a planetary biosphere? Uh, that's the question we ask when we look up there and think about whether we can find anyone, and that's the question we ask when we're looking at what we're doing to the planet now and whether we can transform ourselves into some sort of a stable entity uh, in equilibrium with our biosphere. So um, one interesting answer to the question of what are humans and what is the nature of this transition is we are the first geological force aware of its own existence. We're certainly not the first species to cause radical global change and even global change that led to mass extinctions. That's been done before. That's not original to us, but we're the first ones to look at ourselves and say, oh, we're doing this. Should we be doing it? Can we help doing it? We can ask these questions. So the advent of self-aware cognitive geological processes is a major planetary transition. Can it be a lasting transition? Now, when I think about this, and I look at the, uh, you know, you're, you're all familiar with the, uh, the ge geologic time scale, and we've heard about it this week. And of course, the, um, the Anthropocene is, is proposed as a new epoch, and the epochs are these you know, relatively small uh, periods of time over on the right here that last you know, typically tens of millions of years or less. Um, and there have been a lot of them. They come and go with uh, climate changes and extinctions and so forth. Over on the far left, you see the eon transitions. And sometimes I wonder, are we really looking at an epoch transition here, or could this actually be a new eon? That's an audacious suggestion. I'll tell you why I make it. Each of the eon boundaries, um, and there have been four so far, is a major transition in the relationship between life and the planet. So the Hadean Archean boundary about four billion years ago was roughly speaking the origin of life. Roughly speaking, I'm being crude and fast here, and the geologists are all going to go, no, that's wrong. And, and the, uh, the Archean Proterozoic boundary, about 2.5 billion years ago, that's roughly when life took over the planet, the oxygen catastrophe. Life, obviously, at that time became a global phenomena. The Proterozoic, Phanerozoic boundary, at about 600 million years ago, that's when life became complex. The Cambrian explosion, animals and plants. And now, cognition cognitive processes are affecting planetary processes. And if that can become, and maybe not even here, but anywhere in the galaxy, if that can become a lasting transition, I maintain it's the kind, it's as significant a change in the relationship between life and the planet as these other eon boundaries. And you can't see it here, but I've also differentiated the Anthropocene, by the way, between a proto-Anthropocene and a mature Anthropocene where the proto-Anthropocene is when we're changing the planet and have no idea we're doing it, and the mature Anthropocene is we have that self-awareness and we're actually applying it to how we operate on the planet. And to me, that's an important distinction, and if I was really gonna draw this from some optimistic point in the future, I would say the beginning of the Sapiozoic was when we entered the mature Anthropocene and modified, modified our global interventions based on our awareness of them. Okay, so, um, this makes me wonder, should we think about a Sapiozoic eon? Uh, SETI scientists always talk about looking for other intelligence, but what are we really looking for? Perhaps it would be fruitful for both SETI and, and ourselves to think of, quote, intelligence as not merely the appearance of a of certain kind of civilization on a planet, but a transition in planetary evolution to a time when cognitive processes become deeply integrated into the functioning of a planet. So this is the advent of a radically new type of global change what I call self-aware cognitive geological processes. Can this become a stable long-term feature of a planet? You know, that depends on a lot. It certainly implies a different behavioral mode than is currently being exhibited by, quote, intelligent life. Maybe it's even an interesting way to define a certain kind of intelligent life. If you can reach this point, then you legitimately have a intelligent technological civilization as opposed to maybe what we are have now or are struggling to become. And you can look at this, um, and I don't have time really to talk about this in detail, but you can look at this from a system perspective in terms of feedbacks. The early stages of this transition, what I call the proto-Anthropocene, are highly unstable because global influence precedes global control, and thus you have unstable positive feedbacks. But if you have conscious awareness and self-control, then that's basically a kind of stabilizing negative feedback. And we certainly have some examples of that. You could talk about ozone and the fact that we realized we were causing that problem, and then that led to global action. So we're capable of this, even though we have 
far from, uh, you know, become proficient at it, right? So um, I won't go into detail about this, but if you're interested, I have a, a couple of papers with some colleagues about what we call planetary intelligence, trying to abstract this from just something on Earth to maybe a phenomena, a point where planets reach. Uh, when we define planetary intelligence as the acquisition and application of collective cognitive function operating at a planetary scale and integrated into the function of coupled planetary systems. And um, like I said, th th there's more on this, but I'm not giving an hour talk here, I'm giving 15 minutes. But uh, I do have a paper with two colleagues on intelligence as a planetary scale process, which uh, came out two years ago in the International Journal of Astrobiology. Um, and also a, a magazine piece in The Atlantic, and I, and I wrote a book called Earth in Human Hands where I um, propose uh, this view. So uh, certainly if, you, if you, you're interested and you want to email me and get the references or whatever, I'd be happy to share, and I'd love to know what you think about all this. But uh, I, I'm going to wrap up now with, uh, with a few concluding thoughts. Um, our current global environmental challenges are not just momentary technical puzzles to be solved but part of the task of fundamentally reimagining and reconstructing our relationship with Earth systems. In order to build a he healthy technosphere, we'll need a deepened understanding of the connections between planets and life, between Earth's biosphere and its other physical systems, so that we can learn to work with the Earth instead of against it, and to gracefully integrate our global scale activities within these planetary systems. And the name, my name, perhaps it's um, hopelessly aspirational for this state would be uh, Terra Sapiens or, or Wise Earth. And, um, oh, whoops, I thought, well, there are two more slides. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I have them here on my computer. I don't know why they didn't load, but I'll just read them to you. One is that the key, I think, to this transition is the widespread propagation of a worldview that is global and multi-generational. And I end with a quote from my hero, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, um, talk, I think, uh, who never used the word Anthropocene, but I think um, was referring to this kind of transition when he said, if we are to have peace on Earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation. And this means we must develop a world perspective. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>